Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Leander Sharlockens. I'm a soccer columnist at Yahoo Sports. I have uh, twice in the last year or so written about a uh, fascinating new soccer startup, I think is the best way to call it. I mean, it's, it's more than a team in a lot of ways that was founded by Dennis. Um, so I'm delighted to talk about it, the Kingston Stockade Football Club. Um, which to me is one of the most, I think, fascinating projects going in American sports right now. Um, it's a compliment, thank you. You're welcome. Hi, Dennis. Hi, how you doing? Good, how are Great you? Great to see you here. Yeah. You too. Yeah, good. Yeah, let's All do right, that. <laughs> um, so a lot of tech founders, you, you co-founded Foursquare, when <clears> they <throat> decide they want to dabble in sports, they buy into some existing team. You sort of did the opposite of that, where, you know, you really are bootstrapping something from scratch for not a lot of money. Um, building something, you know, doing laundry, selling merch, <laughs> handing out pocket schedules. So why didn't you just buy into an NBA team like a normal uh, tech founder? Uh, well, I had no interest in the NBA team. Um, but, you know, there's, I, I like to build things. You know, I've had two tech startups that we built from scratch. Neither of them were meant to be big. Neither of them were meant to be companies when we started it. It was just like, hey, this would be a fun thing to have. Like, the world would be a better spot or be more fun if we had built this thing. And that was kind of the idea with the, with the club. You know, we were sitting up in Kingston. Uh, Kingston in, the club is in Kingston, New York. It's in the Hudson Valley. It's about two hours north of the city. I should come up. We have two games this weekend. Um, <laughs> And we were just kind of sitting on the porch one day being like, it would be great if we could just go to a match. But if you wanted to go to a match, you had to drive two hours into the city. And there's tons of people that play. There's all these active pickup scenes. There's all these youth organizations. And there's just no matches to see. And uh, you know, I asked the guys at Pickup League, I'm like, why doesn't anyone put a team up here? And the guys that run the Pickup League were like, we can't even get enough people to show up with balls and cones, never mind to like organize a team. And then I was thinking, you know, I'm, I'm good at organizing stuff. I'll chip in and start that. And then here we are on our second season, and we're doing really well. So you're sort of known to Instagram pictures of you doing team laundry. Um, at this point, you're halfway through your second season. How many loads have you done? How many balls have you inflated? How many pennies <laughs> have you sort of folded and stacked? It's a, it is, it's a lot of work. There's a lot of non-glamorous work. But it, it's like it's startup work, right? If anyone here has worked at a startup and there's like, to people in the company, like you do everything. You answer the phones and you do the biz dev and you clean the bathrooms or whatever it is, right? I'm not cleaning the locker rooms, which is nice. Um, <laughs> but yeah, someone has to do the laundry and someone has to order the pennies and someone has to hand out the flyers and then someone has to promote the home games that are this weekend. And uh, you know, like you just kind of distribute it. Now, the thing that's been great about like when we built Foursquare, we went out and we raised venture capital, and you raise, you know, a check here and a check a couple years later, and you use that check to, you know, to hire employees and, and buy office space or rent office space. We didn't do that with Stockade. We just kind of started it, and we asked the community to help us build this thing. So I mean, we're we're an amateur team in a semi-pro league, which means like we don't pay our players. A lot of them are college players. Uh, the league is called the NPSL. There's you know 96 teams in the league across the country. Um, we think some of them pay their players. A lot of most of them do not, um, since like the semi-pro league nature of it. Um, but we set the club up as a nonprofit, and uh, we're certainly not generating you know profit right now. Um, but we're trying to figure out a way that you could start a club in you know a small market. Kingston's what 20,000 people, 20, 20 and change. And you know, could you run it like a successful local business? I think there's this stigma that, um, hey, if you're in sports or you invested in sports, especially a team, you're just lighting money on fire. And that's a, that's a bad stigma, right? right? And so I'm really passionate about this idea of, hey, there should be a soccer, uh, there should be a lower level soccer team in like every community that would support it across the country. There's probably rooms for hundreds or thousands of them, um, but people need to know how to make them. And so we're approaching this project as, how can what we're doing with Stockade be the mechanism that teaches other people how to do this in their own communities? So you've taken a really open source approach. You basically, you know, after, at the start of your first season, at the end of your first season, you wrote this long post on Medium sort of explaining exactly what you've done, line by line budget item. Here's how much we spent. Here's how much we made back. Here's what the, what the sort of final balance sheet was. Um, why do that? What's the thinking behind that when, when sports is an inherently competitive business? You're supposed to compete with everybody else rather than show them what to do. Yeah, I think, um, 
you know, a couple things, right? So when we had this idea to start, start the club, like the first thing I did is go to Google and it's like, how do you start a soccer club from scratch? And there was like, there was no results. I mean, there's a bunch of results, but they weren't very high quality results. And it's like, that's like, there's an opportunity to do something there. And so instead of just like building something in isolation, like we should build it in, in public. Um, and I feel like we've kind of done this with, with Foursquare. Like my, my approach to building Foursquare, the company, um, has, and we're, you know, we're eight years old, there's probably 250 people work there now, um, has been to, you know, teach the employees how we make it as we go along. Like, you don't just come and work here, it's like, we're gonna teach you about the board decks and fundraising and how sales teams work and management and, you know, I feel like that's a better experience for everyone. And so we're applying that same type of thinking to, um, you know, to building this soccer club, right? So let's just be, instead of everyone, you know, being closed lips about like, are you making money, are you losing money? What was your attendance? No one knows. It's like, we'll just share everything. Like every bit of data that we had from that season, we put it up in this huge medium post. If you want to see how many t-shirts we sold on the Saturday night game where it was raining, you know, like I, those numbers are there, do whatever you want with them. And since we've done that, you know, all these people have come out of the woodwork asking me like, hey, I, I'm, I'm motivated and inspired by this, the story of your club. You know, you've laid out this instruction manual of sorts of how to do it, you know, we're gonna get to work and try to do it. And so I went to, you know, I went to the owner's meeting in, um, you know, the NPSL, our league has an owner's meeting every year. And uh, it was, last year we went down, I think it was in Orlando, and we ran into a club that had read the blog post and like, we started from scratch off of what you built. And you know, now I just saw on Instagram that they had like 2,500 people at their last game in Asheville, North Carolina. And I was like, that's, that's amazing. And I, I hear from people all over that are like, you know, hey, just seeing the numbers and having a little bit of transparency into how much it costs or how much work it is or how many people need to help out or how long the season is or whatever is just enough of a push to get them started. Right. And you know, my thesis has been, like, if, if there are, you know, hundreds or not thousands of these lower level, lower level teams and leagues in the U.S. all kind of working together, all building something great, like, that is good for soccer across the U.S. There was an information deficit there. Yeah, just, I mean, there, you, you, there's no books in Barnes and Nobles that you can just pull off. It's like, how to start a league in the NPSL? And, you know, I mean, one of my, one of my big regrets with Foursquare is we learned so much as we did it. But you're so, we were so busy building it that you didn't have any time to reflect on like why you built it or how you built it or what worked and what didn't. And so those stories only get passed on to other people by like you sitting on stage. And you can only do that with so many people, right? Um, and so it's like, okay, what if you just took a couple hours at the beginning of the season and a couple hours at the end of the season to write one big blog post about what is happening here? What did we learn? And then how do you just like pass that on to other people? And now like we've seen other teams doing the same thing, being transparent with their numbers, you know, writing their like post season manifestos about what worked and what didn't. You know, teams teaching other teams the most effective way to stream, the most effective way to sell merchandise, the most effective way to, you know, um, distribute tickets and do marketing on a small budget. So it's like, it's something is starting. And we've played a role in, in help, you know, in helping get some of that movement started. But like, this is like, this is just the beginning of this stuff. We've only been doing this for two seasons. And like, we're already, I and mean, I probably talked to two dozen clubs that are like trying to get started based off of the model. Now, I, I don't know if they're all gonna get started. I don't know if they're all gonna join our league. Like some of them might just fizzle out. But there's like, there's a lot of people that are kind of interested in, in the direction that this is going. And I just wanna keep kind of fueling that a little bit. So you, you get this momentum going, you take this collaborative approach, and, and maybe the end goal is to have a team in the next town over from Kingston, to have one in Newburgh and one in Albany, et cetera. Um, what, what's the end game? I mean, you, you also have sort of uh, hopes for soccer in America as a whole, don't you? Yeah, there was, you know, we wrote this, um, the first big blog post I wrote, I wrote it on the, on the eve of our first match, um, which we lost, which is a bummer. Um, and, um, you know, I, I kind of laid out, like, why even do this? Because that's, that's what people ask me. They're like, hey, you know, Johnny Foursquare, why are, you, why are you spending your time building this, like, fourth division soccer team? And it's like, there's, there's a couple things, right? Like, number one, I think it's good for the community. The community has something to rally around. Like, that was, that was a thesis that turned out to be true. Um, the second one is, like, we knew there was a lot of talented players up there, and we heard this from people that they were just, you know, they'd be seen, they'd be scouted once, and then kind of overlooked. And it's like, if you could build something up here, could you build a pipeline for that talent 
to, to get seen on a, on a higher stage, right? Could you build something that inspired, um, inspired the, the youth leagues to want to stick with, so with soccer longer, like to not switch over to American football, to not um, you know, get distracted and be like, hey, I want to be in the NBA someday. Like, we, we meet a lot of kids that now that are like, I want to play for Stockade someday. And I'm like, you're eight. All I got to do is keep the team going long enough for you to play, and I bet you're going to be great. And I want you to show up you know, at every one of our home games this season, next season, and beyond. And like, we're seeing that. Like, that's, that's starting to happen. But you know, like, one of, the, you know, one of the, the main things was, uh, you know, I, I, we bought, we've been to the last couple World Cups. We've been following the national team forever. Like, the national team is like my, my, my first team, my favorite team. And, um, you know, like, you go out for drinks with buddies and everyone talks, like, what, what has to happen in the world for the U.S. to win a, win a World Cup uh, in our lifetime? And everyone's like, oh, it doesn't happen until the U.S. turns into a soccer nation. And then that's the end of the conversation. It's like, all right, well, what do you do to turn the U.S. into a soccer nation so we can get to the point where the U.S. is more competitive in the World Cup? Um, and it's like, well, I don't know. We'll have to have open systems. We'll have to have better sources for talent. We'll have to have more clubs around the country. OK, well, we'll start one of those clubs, and we'll make a whole bunch of mechanisms and toolboxes and toolkits and instruction manuals that make it easier for other teams to do the same thing. And maybe that's start something. So like, are we going down the right path with this? Like, I don't know. But it is certainly better than not doing anything. And I feel like the stuff that we've built in Kingston and the stuff that we've already accomplished in this area and the way that we've been able to inspire a few teams and markets outside of New England or even outside of the, of the, of the East Coast has been, um, like, I think that's all kind of good stuff that's happening. You're creating jobs, essentially, for soccer players. Uh, well, I aspire to. You know, right. like we're, we're not paying our players yet. And so I want to figure out a way that we pay our players. And so I can only pay the players if I can get the, um, if I can get the team to break even. You know, like, I mean, there's, there's, a, there's another way to do this, which is just you dump a bunch of money into a club. And it's like, look at us. We're, we have this amazing roster in D4, and we're investing very heavily into it. It just that, that doesn't feel like it does any good, right? Like, the, the way to do good is to, is to, is to do this, my, my belief, is to do it on kind of a shoestring budget and get the club to break even. And then it's like, listen, this is the blueprint for how to make a club from scratch in a small market. I'm not talking we're in a market with, you know, half a million people or a million people. There's 20,000 people in this town, and we got this club to break even. Okay, after you do that, how do you set up a youth organization? Okay, after you do that, how do you play a longer season so you can increase the gate revenue and the merchandise sales? After you do that, can you use some of that revenue to start paying the players? After you do that, are you paying a longer season? Are you more competitive? Can you move yourself up a level? And so these, like, there's all these, instead of just like sitting around and, and bitching about how this stuff doesn't work on Twitter, like, it's much more meaningful to try to do something about it and try to solve some of the, some of the problems. But you don't really understand the problems unless you start, unless you get inside of the problem and start building. And so that's kind of what, what we're doing. It's like, let's, let's get inside of it and try to figure it out. And then let's do the best that we can to publish our model. And uh, let's just see if that brings about you know, greater transparency, more interest in this. And you know, like the, the US is, is, is ripe for this, right? You've got the US Open Cup. That's probably the most underutilized sports asset in, in the US right now. Uh, you've got you know, the biggest sport of the world that is still not taking a hold in, in the US, but it will. Uh, you got all these kids that are growing up playing FIFA, watching all these you know, ab leagues abroad because they're on in the morning instead of cartoons. Um, and then you know, you've got everything that's going on with the NFL and, and, ki and parents not wanting to have their kids play American football. So it's like there, there cannot be any more of these stars aligning to make this work. It just needs a little bit more organization. You didn't intentionally set out to sort of disrupt soccer as an industry, and, and maybe it's a little early for that word anyway, but what are sort of the obstacles that you ran into early on of here's how things are done, but here are maybe ways of doing them better? Um, well, some of it is just, it's like lo it's local politics. Like, oh, you, like, you know, we don't want your team to use the, the, the field. Like, it t like it, that wasn't just a given that we could use that, right? And then it's like, well, in order to generate revenue, I need concessions, but I don't have access to concessions at the field. I mean, this is like small ball, right. um, you know, trying to get this to work up in Kingston. The, the bigger issue is, is, like, even if we get the club to break even, 
right? And which is which would be a great thing. And like you know, we are number one in our conference right now, which is awesome. Super psyched about it. Uh, we have two home games this weekend in Kingston. You should really come up and, and see us try to clinch it. Uh, one's on that's Saturday. That's one's now. on uh, keep it going. One's on Monday. <laughs> um, and we and we have 20 minutes left. Yeah. Um, and so I just totally lost my train of thought. What were we just talking about? Um, <laughs> talking about sort of the obstacles to, to getting this going. Oh, oh so e even if even if we make the even if we can make the whole thing work from like the manis manifesto point of view, and even if like you know we're, the team is competitive right now, uh, I want the team to qualify for a U.S. Open Cup slot. I don't know if we'll do it this year. My goal was to do it in, in five years. Like that's that's kind of the goal of the club. But once once we're in this system, even if we win the whole league, we don't we don't move anywhere else. Like we don't we don't advance up. Um, you know, every other system, I don't, we don't have to turn this into a huge promotion relegation thing, but like every other system in the world, uh, not every other system, but I think it's 209 out of 211, um, you know, support, have the system of like, hey, teams move up and down depending on performance, depending on merit. And the, the U.S. just doesn't have this yet. And there's all sorts of reasons why it doesn't, but like we really should try to figure out how to make it work in, in the lower levels, right? And so if there was a chance for D4 to perform and move up to D3, like, then there's a reason to start investing a little bit more, to spend a little bit more recklessly, to like in, invest in something that might take, you know, ten years to pay back instead of two or three seasons, because you have a shot of moving up to this right. D three area, um, and, you know, I think that's kind of the. I think that's the fundamental piece that's missing right now. And I think there's a lot of people talking about ways to, to change that. And it would certainly be in our club's best interest if that, you know, hey, if, if we could you know, move up a division, that, that'd be fantastic. There'd be more competitive in the league. There'd be more teams in the league. There'd be more investment in the league, more investment in youth. Like, I think it's, it's hard to argue against that in a lot of ways. Well, the, the promotion relegation thing is, is sort of a hot button issue in soccer, uh, but because it's a you know, the, the leagues are fairly young and, and establishing themselves in many ways. But if that's something that could take hold, do you think this open system where teams are rewarded for, clubs are rewarded for doing well and sort of following best practices and investing, and the ones that don't conversely are sort of punished for it, do you see benefits for that for other sports? Um, yeah, I think, I mean, I've, I've heard people talk about should the NBA have some, have some form of that, right? Like, if you, if you took what people are trying to make happen with, um, with lower level sports and promotion and relegation in the US modeled on like a, Euro, on a European model, like could you do that in, um, could you do that with basketball in the, in the US? Now, it, I mean, the NBA suffers from some of the, I think the same, the same issues that the MLS does in the sense it's like it's a franchise system, you pay to have your way in, and it's very difficult to have a team come out of there after someone's paid a huge amount to get in. Um, and so you're still going to have some of those primary issues, but like I think another big hurdle is just you know Division Two or Division Three in the NBA is a, is the NCAA. Right. The NCAA has you know it, it adds all sorts of complications, not just for basketball but for you know, for soccer too. You know like one of the reasons that we play a short season in the um, uh, in, the MP, in the thank you in the, in the MPSL is uh, you know we use all college guys and you know the rules are if we have one college guy. Uh, if, if, even if we just have one college guy, we can't have one other uh, paid player right. on a team. And so, I mean, I, I'm not schooled in this enough to have like a really strong sure. opinion as to like how to fix that. But like, there's a lot of there's a lot of things I think kind of working at odds against making some of that work. And right. so there's a lot. It's it's a very complex issue. It's interesting though about soccer to to take this approach where it's like, okay, how do we all get better? How do we rise the tide to to lift all of the boats? Um, you, you made, true to your roots, I think, a real investment in tech for um, the stockade, even though um, you know, the, the budget is not enormous. You know, you're, you're streaming on your games on YouTube. Again, you can watch them. The, um, actually, this year, Facebook. Facebook, yeah, I'm we sorry. We tried Facebook this year. Well, I mean, part of the, the learning process, like we did YouTube last year. We, we were going to go with an independent streaming provider this year and try to do a whole thing for the league. We just couldn't pull it off. And uh, we're trying Facebook this year. And then, you know, at the end of the season, we'll write our uh, pros and cons, Facebook versus YouTube. So as your team gets started, which one should you choose? I'm sorry, I interrupted. No, no, that's fine. Um, so what have you found to be the key on a low budget to, to really drive traction with, with your fan base, which has grown very quickly? Uh, you know, it's, it's just, it's all kind of guerrilla marketing. 
You know, like my pockets are full of stickers and schedules. Like I bring stuff on stage here in case anyone's interested after. You know, I'm trying to sh shamelessly promote our two home games this coming weekend, Saturday and Monday, uh, up in Kingston. Um, it, but that, that's, how it, that's how it works. I mean, this is what we did, my first company, Dodgeball. Like, we had no marketing budget. It was just guerrilla marketing. Foursquare was guerrilla marketing for, like, two years straight. And, like, what, what does that mean? That doesn't mean, like, we have street teams going out and doing stuff. It means, like, you just give out, like, you make a product that people love, and you tell them to help you spread the word about it. Um, I think that, like, the amazing and kind of beautiful thing about what's going on in Kingston with the Stockade Club is, like, every match we have you know, 30 volunteers show up wearing their orange stockade t-shirts that we gave them. And it's almost like we have too many volunteers sometimes. Like, people just want to be a part of it. And that means, like, those are the people that are streaming the matches are volunteers. The people on the roof setting up the tent that covers the camera. The people doing play-by-play. -play, the guy operating the clock. The people doing the stats. You know, like, that we have youth organizations that are lined up like at the beginning of the season that want to be ball boys and want to help carry stuff. And it's just like, it's, it's just this amazing thing to see so many people wanting to help us build this thing. And I think we've done a great job at kind of harnessing that energy and turning it into you know, a way to actually execute all these things. Um, and so, I mean, everything down to like the photographers, like it's volunteer photographers that come out and cover us too. It's just, it's a, it's a lot of, it's a lot of fun. And I think it's like all, it's a lot of fun for people to be a part of it. And I also think it's, it's helping people learn um, like, hey, this is what goes into publishing. This is like, we're teaching people how to be announcers. We're teaching people <laughs> how to be play-by-play -play people. And it's like, there's something awesome about that. How did you come up with a, with a long-term plan? Uh, you know, being new to soccer, being new to sports in, in sort of a formal setting. Um, how did you kind of draw that up and, and how's that going? Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a good question. You know, it's like, um, I think when you like, for people here that have done startups before, like when you're doing a startup, you're kind of like so in just like the day-to-day -day survival or like I just want to make sure the company is around next month type of survival that you don't have the luxury to do long-term thinking. And I think one of the, one of the like, luxuries that, I, that I've had out of the Foursquare experience is like, we kept the thing going eight years. Like, we're doing really well right now. And so we've had the luxury to think about like, what does it look like three years, five years, 10 years? And I think once you give yourself, once you get yourself in that mind frame where you can, where you can actually think about that and it's, and it's like, a per, like a productive exercise, it doesn't feel like stupid or foolish to think, what does our small time soccer team look like in 10 years? Once you, once you can get over that hurdle, you know, you can start making these kind of audacious plans. You know, like my goal was five years will qualify for the Open Cup, right? My goal was like 10 years, let's, I'm making this up, I'm not making this up, like this is on my computer, but like <laughs> I made this, made this up, right? It's like, okay, 10 years, let's have our own soccer specific stadium near Kingston. It should have 5,000 seats that would qualify us to be in the D3 league if we wanted to. And let's do as much work as we can so that we can actually earn our way into a higher league as opposed to having to buy ourselves into a higher league. You know, let's have a profitable, um, let's have a profitable club where the revenue goes to finance a youth organization. It goes to finance a women's team that we'd like to have as well. Um, and we have some money left over to pay some of our players. Like, that's crazy. Like, I have no idea how that's going to work. But I don't really care because, like, I've done enough of the Foursquare stuff where it's like, I have no idea how we get to profitability. But eventually, we just figure it out. And I think once you kind of get in that mind frame of, like, if you just... If you plan far enough in the future, and that is like the vision for what you want to do, and like every day you wake up and you just do a little bit of work to try to get there, like it eventually starts to come together. Uh, and so I don't know. I feel maybe I'm just a little like hopelessly aloof about a lot of this stuff, but that's that's just where I see it all going. You had a shorter term sort of breakdown as well, didn't you? Or was like year one figure it out, year two, you know? Oh yeah, it was. You know, year one, get inside the league and try to figure out how to make it work. Um, you know, at the end of year one, share, share all the numbers, right? See if we can if we can influence or not influence, but like help other teams get started. You know, by the end of that, it's like okay, now now we like we survive. At the, at, then you go into year two, try to make year two better than year one, 
at the end of year two, it's like, okay, now what have we learned about this league, about other leagues? Like, is there a way that we can get some of the teams together to, to shape the policy in our league or shape the policy in other leagues? Uh, and so that's, that's some of the stuff they're starting to think about. Like, you know, our league is a member-driven organization. Like, the league does what the teams want to do, and the teams have to get organized about that, and so that's part of what we're trying to do. Um, and so, you know, there's this, you know, the whole politics thing of like, you know, be the change that you want to see. Like, that's a huge idea, but like, it also can apply down to these lower levels. If we want to change, you know, the way that soccer is perceived and operates and the way the leagues are structured in the U.S., like, you don't just have to sit idly by, like, you can go do something about it. And I think part of that is just getting involved in some way. Even if you don't make a team, go out and support a local team. Become one of those volunteers. That, that helps out, you, you know, your local team. And I think all that, you know, all that contributes to the greater good. Last one before we open up to some questions. Um, questions from you. Can anyone do this? Can anyone do what you have done? I mean, you, you had some startup know-how and you had some connections, obviously, that helped you, I, I think, with the design of your logo and things like that. Um, or, or is the whole point of this to make it so that anyone can do it? Yeah, the goal has been to make it so anyone can, can do it. You know, I've kind of been really conscious about, like, the idea of, oh, we just threw a bunch of money at the problem, and that's how we made the team work. Like, no, look at the numbers. We spent north of 100 grand. Like, we lost, you know, a little bit more than 10 grand last year. Um, you know, the club was about 12% away from break even on year one, which, which isn't, that's not crazy. That seems like it's doable, especially if you can see it, how it works over three years' time. Um, I'm definitely aware of the, like, oh, well, hey, I get to sit on stage and talk about how awesome our club is, and, like, that's cheating a little bit, right? Because look at me, I'm a high-profile tech guy. I can talk about my stuff all the time and plug our two home games this weekend, you know, one on Saturday and one on Monday. Um, but at the same time, like, we are operating in a super small market, right? So we have some advantages and we also have some disadvantages. You know, like, I was looking at, I was on Twitter this morning, and there's a couple guys that are tracking the, um, like, end, our league attendance uh, across the league, right? Uh, uh, team by team, and, and, you know, 96 teams, not all of them are reporting. I think maybe, like, 25 of them, or maybe 30 of them are reporting. Um, and we didn't crack the first 10, and it kind of broke the, the top 10 of, in attendance. You know, and it, because, you know, we draw, we, we, we haven't broken 1,000 fans a game yet. Like, our last home game, we got to 992. Uh, maybe this Saturday and this Monday, with help from you guys, we'll actually we'll break it. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm, I'm looking at these other markets, like Little Rock, Arkansas, Detroit, Chattanooga. Um, gosh, I wish I had the list in front of me. And I'm like, these are just, these are just bigger markets. And it, not to say that it's, it's easier, but like they have the advantage of it's just a bigger market. And so I feel like we are using our advantage, which is, hey, I get to speak on stage, and I get to, you know, retweet to my followers and stuff. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, I feel like we're still, it's, a, it's an uphill battle, and we're still just trying to make it work. Should we have some questions? I think that'd be fun to do questions. Okay, any questions? Oh, go for it. Sorry, go ahead. To have, so here, do you, I'll repeat the question. Wait, the question was, um, uh, we want to pay the players, so how do we actually pay the players? Where does the, where does the revenue come from to pay the players? Yeah, more like our external partnerships with them. Yeah, yeah, so there's, um, I, I don't know if we like do individual player sponsorship type of things, but I mean, we have sponsors for the team. If anyone's interested in sponsoring the team, come down and talk to me, please. <laughs> um, I might even have free swag for you. Uh, but. You know, like there's a couple different revenue streams we have. We have sponsorships. So, like up in Kingston, the local Trailways, the the bus uh, company, is our primary sponsor in the front of the logo. Uh, radio Woodstock, you know, like the radio stations uh, on the sleeve. Dragon Search, with a, a tech company, has like the uh, the, the back spot, the, the tramp stamp sponsorship, and um, that those are their words, not mine. Uh, and you know, but there's but there's a couple 
sources of revenue we don't have access to. We don't have access to concessions, which I'm trying to figure out. If you can sell beer at the stadium, which we cannot, that's a big revenue driver for a lot of clubs. Um, you know, when clubs start opening up and talking about this is how we make the money, it's like, oh, wow, a lot of it comes from beer, a lot of it comes from parking. We don't control that. Media rights is another big part of it. Um, you know, we're not on any TV station. We haven't sold a streaming sponsorship yet. Uh, actually, we did to, to, AT and, uh, to the local AT&T shop, um, but not, not part of a, a national thing. But as we start to get bigger sponsorships, as this club starts to see additional revenue sources, it's that revenue that would go to finance things like the youth organization, uh, the women's team, and, and paid players. Even if we had a windfall of money, I don't know if it would go right to the players, because we need those college players to be competitive. Um, and so that, it's just a tricky thing to figure out, and it's really difficult to, um, you know, we have six home games, right? So I got to make enough money in six home games to cover the expenses of the entire, of the entire club. Uh, I'd love to play a longer season, but like I lose the college players. And if, you know, I want, and to play that longer season, it'd be great to have a mix of college players and pro players, but I can't play the pro players. It's, it's just, it's really, really challenging. Uh, by the way, what size t-shirt are you? <laughs> a small, looks like you are in, uh, in luck. That's why we bring swag here. That's not going to fit you, buddy. You should pass it over. <laughs> <laughs> More questions? I think we have microphones going around. We don't have t-shirts for everyone. Okay. Limited supply is going to run out soon. Uh, a lot more hands just went up. Yeah. Uh, over here, up to upper. Oh, I was like, row. how are you doing yeah. that without moving yeah. your mouth? <laughs> so um, you've talked about engagement with kids and with um, youth. It's a two-part question. First is, how are you doing that kind of outreach to, to the younger clubs? And the second part of the question is, when do you guys play next? Oh, well, <laughs> thanks for asking. You know, we have two home games this, uh, this weekend, one on Saturday, one on Monday. If we, uh, if we get four points this weekend, I believe that we clinch uh, first place in our conference, which would be amazing. Uh, yes, thank you. Wait, what was the first question? <laughs> I'll tell you what, we, we haven't done a good job reaching out to youth. Um, we, it's, this is one of the things that we screwed up in the second year. We just kind of took it for granted that this, we'd have the same audience. And we, we have roughly the same audience, but like, we should be hitting every youth organization and being like, OK, we've got to get you in here, group ticket rates for everyone. It's just a lot of work to do the, to do the outreach. Um, the best thing, the most surprising thing, the most awesome thing about the club was our very first game, I expected there'd be like 200 people that showed up. This is last year. And then you know, you're so busy running around, you don't even see the fans fill up. And then by the time the game starts, you look behind, and I was like, holy shit, there's 800 people here. At the, end of the, at the end of the first match, all these kids rush down to the front. Uh, like, and thankfully, there's a, there's a fence. The fence is about this high. And all these fans, rush, the, the kids, six, eight, five, whatever, get to the front, and they're banging on the fence. They want the players to come over. And the players are kind of scared shitless, right? Like, what do we do? I'm like, signs, do we have any pens? We have no pens. We have, OK, we have one Sharpie. We've got to get 100 kids to get autographs on whatever they have, because we didn't have any photos or programs or anything at that point. But like every game, this happens. All these kids runs down, and now we're organized. So like all the players stick around and sign autographs like 30 minutes after. And it's just like this, it's this awesome thing that's happening that you, like I've never seen that at all the Red Sox games I've been to, all the Yankees games I've been to, all the MLS games I've gone to. I mean, it's like a, a super exclusive thing, but it's like, Anyone that comes to these matches gets a chance to interact with the players, and that's a huge, meaningful thing for the, for, the, for the kids. And we hear that from the parents, and that's what brings them out all the time. And so all I'm thinking about now is, like, how do I get, how do we make that happen more and more and more and more? Not just to put butts in the seats, right, which is also important. It drives revenue, whatever. But to, like, inspire these kids to play for this team and stick with the sport in the future. I think we have time for one or two more, depending on how fast you can talk. T-shirt, I got you. Oh. <laughs> Any questions right there? Hi, thank you for thank you for coming here and telling your story. Um, you were saying that um, you know you can only make revenue in the six home games. Basically, have you thought about stream, um, paying, uh, building a subscription model for the streaming of the away games, and is the league working on that? Yeah, um, the the quality isn't high enough to to offer to pay for a, to, to do a, a, a pay for play model. Um, it's in, in streaming away games is such a pain in the ass. It's like an iPod and a tripod, uh, iPad on a tripod with a MiFi, and you know buddies of mine that are drinking beers like doing the play-by-play -play as best they can on Facebook Live. It's a great experience. You should watch. Um, <laughs> but it's you know because a lot of the stadiums just don't have the infrastructure to do it. Like we you know people come to our stadium and it's like 
we have the rosters, we have water and sandwiches and a press box and Wi-Fi, anything you need. And we go to some of these other places and they're like, sorry, we don't have any stands. There's no place for fans to sit and you can put your tripod on the side of the sideline if you want. And so it's just like, that, that's not minimum standards aren't being met. So we've got to solve some of those issues first of all. I'd love to have like a, a rig that we bring, but we just don't, you know, there's no reason to, like there, we don't have the ability to invest in that type of stuff yet if we're trying to get the club uh, to break even as quickly as possible. But I, I think if we keep kind of banging away at this and if we can be partners with other folks in our conference and other folks in our league, we'd certainly be able to do that. Last one, quickly. Hi. And as you talked about in five years, the ideal of you know, almost or 10 years building a stadium and all that, and obviously most sports teams have had to have some pretty strong relationships with the local government, local, you know, the um, support system there. So in the last couple of years, like how important has that connection with local municipalities and even the broader in terms of like not only growing awareness of the team, but actually like getting the assets you need to continue to build uh, your franchise? Yeah, I mean, we, we play at a, at a high school, um, Kingston High School, uh, like the football field. But the football field isn't tied to the high school. It's like in the middle of, of the uptown. So it's weird, but it's awesome. Uh, there's a track that goes around it, which isn't ideal. There's seats for 1,500 people. The locker rooms need a refresh really, really badly. Um, you know, like, I have no idea how we do the stadium stuff. I, li I literally have no idea. I can think of, like, some ways to do it. But I think, like, oh, it's five years off, 10 years off. We'll solve it then. Um, but what's been interesting is, like, when you get a thousand people together regularly and then you send them off into the town and to go you know drink and eat and shop with the local merchants like the local politicians start to pay attention and so you have all these people that are angling to like hey i want to i want to be there i want to carry out the first ball i want to address the crowd and so like as that starts to happen like you bring them to the match and they're like i haven't seen anything like this in the hudson valley before and it's like can you help us get the things that we need and they're always like, well, what is the ask? I'm like, I don't, I don't know what the ask is yet. It's probably some, like, we apply for a grant or state. I, I, I don't know. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that's affiliated to parks and recs that we got to figure out. It's a whole other world I haven't spent a lot of time with. But um, there's, there's ways to do it. It's just, it's just figuring it out. And so, you know, like, I was just shooting the shit with someone the other day about, like, what are you going to write about? You already wrote about all the stuff you could write about in your next blog post. I'm like, I have no idea how to get the concessions working. I have no idea how to change some of the policies here. Bless you. I have no idea how to get the stadium built. I have no idea how to do uh, the youth organization. We have years and years of stuff worth to figure it out. And it's just like, if we just get the club to break even, it's like, you could do the club forever, right? And so that's the goal. A goal, like my, the thing that drives me is like that eight-year-old kid that runs down to the fence and gets their autograph signed by every single player, not just one game, but he does it every single game, which is weird, but um, I, I, that, he, that club needs to be around for that kid to play for 10 years from now. And like, that's, that's gonna be the most awesome moment. I'm afraid we're out of time. That was fun. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you for uh, having me. Um, if you'd like to talk more about soccer or the upcoming games on Saturday and Monday, I have some stuff here too. And stickers and schedules. Find me outside. Thanks.